morning, church family. It is great to see you on this time change. Very rainy, wet, cold Sunday morning. Thank you so much for being here. This is your very first time with us at Coates Baptist. We welcome you. We would love for you to take a few moments uh, between now and the end of the service and complete a connection card and let us know uh, of your attendance here. You can find one of these cards just in the seat back in front of you. It's also available online at our website and you could submit it digitally. We would love to hear from you and then follow up with you uh, in the subsequent hours and days ahead. Uh, this morning, as we open our service, we always want to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll stand and sing. And this morning, I want to lay a thought before you that I hopefully will, will guide you in prayer, but also guide you throughout the morning as we study God's Word together. And that is that we would ask the Lord to free us from mental distraction. I know that many times as a pastor, as uh, many times if you, if, you, if you do any kind of teaching, whether in public school system, whatever it might be, even in the local church, uh, many times you prepare to teach and you prepare to teach God's people and your mind itself is uh, cluttered with distractions and thoughts and also the people themselves. Well, this morning is one of those for me and I am just simply personally persuaded perhaps it's the same for you. I just have a lot going on in my mind. I'm thinking about the weather outside. I'm thinking about the sniffle that I have in my, in my head cold and all the rest. I'm just thinking about a lot of things. Well, this morning we're studying Acts chapter 2 and that text is going to require us to think. So let me ask you this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship that we would ask the Lord to help us mentally that we would ask him to free us from mental distraction, that we would have our focus, our attention on him, and that we would simply come to the Lord's house, come to this service this morning saying, Lord, I believe that I'm not only here on purpose, but I believe that you have something that you want to teach me this morning. I also believe, Lord, that you want to change me on the inside. It's a belief that I believe, Lord, that I don't want to leave this place the same way that I came in. So let's take a few, just a few moments in quiet and ask the Lord, Lord, would you free me of mental distraction, that my best attention would be yours this morning, and that, Lord, you would teach me, you would make me and mold me, and that, Lord, this morning on a rainy time change Sunday morning, this would be the time that, Lord, you teach me, perhaps like you have never taught me before, that you would give me a hunger for your word. And that, Lord, you would give me a love for your people. And that, Lord, I am overwhelmingly thankful to be here this morning. Let's pray something like that. Father, it is always good to remember your common grace. The Lord, you send rain on the just and the unjust. But many of us woke up this morning and we were perhaps even discouraged that we lost an hour of sleep and that it was a cold rain outside. Father, I pray that you would help us now think Christianly, that we did sleep, and that you woke us, and that there is rain outside, and rain means water, and water means life. And Lord, it's Sunday morning, the time of the week where your people with intentionality and purpose gather as the local assembled church. And we do so, Lord, because we love you and we love one another. And as we gather, we testify that we are yours and we are here for you. So, Lord, as we stand in just a few moments, Lord, would your spirit move in us to direct our hearts towards the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would have an attitude, Lord, even this morning and this hour, that we would not consume something, but we would give something, 
that we'd render ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, and that we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices, that we would seek to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And that, Lord, you would first and foremost speak and teach our heads so that then you can get to our hearts. So, God, help us. We are a dependent people, ever needing, Lord, your grace and the movement of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. God, as we sing now, we sing for you in the riches of your grace, Lord. We thank you for the Lord's people. We thank you for Sunday morning. Have your way at this time. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing together. steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things sing of his goodness you're good you're good and i witnessed it you're strong and i witnessed it you're constant i witnessed it and i'm confident I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it. And I'm confident. I'll see it again and again. You're good and I've witnessed it. You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it, you heal and I've witnessed it, you save and I've witnessed it. 
gift of grace that is Jesus our redeemer what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace
Good morning, church. Our reading this morning comes from Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Thank you, Miss Lyle. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your people and their love for your word. And Lord, as we have our Bibles now open, we pray that you would speak on behalf of what your Holy Spirit has spoken and penned for our instruction and for our good. So God, I pray that you would cause the people of Coates Baptist Church this morning to be renewed and to be reminded of who they are and what they believe. And Lord, be glad in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Lord, we thank you for Sunday mornings. We thank you for the gathered church. Oh God, we thank you that we can look to our left and to our right, behind and in front, and see people following Jesus with us. God, thank you for the blessing of biblical community. And God, we ask this morning that you would give your attention now to us. In Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as Ms. Lena just read this morning, our text under consideration is Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 4. This is the day of Pentecost, and we're going to look at this day and this event really over the course of two Sunday mornings. As you've been studying the book of Acts, you'll know that this scene really goes all the way through verse 13. We'll take verse 5 through verse 13 next Sunday morning, Lord willing, but this morning we're going to focus in on verse 1 through verse 4. And as we've prayed, as we've thought together, uh, we're asking the Lord to give us a clear, focused, attentive mind, not simply to what I'm saying, but to what the Lord is saying through his messenger, through his word this morning, what is he communicating to us for our good, for our benefit, for his glory. So we have a Bible in our hands, we have the Spirit of God within us, and we're ready to get to work this morning. Over the last couple of years, as you well know, um, a group of us on Friday morning have been studying the book of Acts. And we started about two and a half years ago, and we are now in the middle part of chapter 14, just studying it line by line. So I've been looking at Acts 2 uh, with attention for quite some time, as many other men in our church have. They've contributed to the study of God's Word, and as I've told them through the years, uh, they even contribute to the pulpit, the preaching event, as we study the book of Acts. 
And as I've thought about Acts 2, not only have I thought about it with expectation, with joy, with excitement, this is obviously the day of Pentecost, but I thought also about how in the world do you introduce a text like this? There's been all kinds of cultural and doctrinal confusion over the years about what is Pentecost and what do we make of this day. There's even been denominations formed as of recent in the last 100 or so years called Pentecostalism and derivatives from that denomination. How do we do an introduction? How do we think about the day of Pentecost, specifically in Acts chapter 2? Well, as you well know, that we try to make the main thrust of our ministry a teaching ministry here at Coach Baptist, not just behind the pulpit, but in every circle, and every ministry of life here at the church. We want to be textual. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to do what we do every single Sunday morning. I want to begin in the text. I want to direct your mind to the first word of our text this morning, which is when and I want to take it from there. Not really much of an introduction. I want you to be a text-driven church. I want you to be a text-driven Christian. I want your theology not built upon an ism, but I want your theology built upon a text. So here we go this morning. Let's dive in to these four verses, taking the very first word of the very first verse of the passage this morning and the title uh, of the text, if, if you, the first word of the, of the title text is, is, is when, obviously. Three headings as, that I want to work through as we work through the text. Number one, the setting, that will be the when of the text. Then I want you to see the signs. We're going to look at two visible symbols and signs, namely uh, a sound and something to see, sight. And then thirdly, I want you to see the significance of what we find here on the day of Pentecost. That'll be verse 4. And just so you know, as I've studied, and I'm sure you'll agree with me as we get done with this Sunday and next Sunday and, and subsequent Sundays, as we look at the day of Pentecost, I'm not so sure verse 2 and verse 3 carry nearly as much weight as verse 1 and verse 4. And everyone wants to direct their attention to flaming tongues and sounds and all the rest. Um, that's phenomenon, obviously, but I don't think that's nearly as impactful of what's going on in verse 1 and verse 4. So that's just kind of a footnote. Let's pick it up in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now let's say when, and then let's stop there at the word when. What does that mean? Why is Luke giving us that word when? Well, he's dating, isn't he? He's dating a time, a chronological calendar, and he's saying when the day of Pentecost has arrived. Now we stop and we ask ourselves the question, what time is it? What time is it not this morning, but what time is it in our Bibles? We understand that we are 50 days, five zero, from the day of Passover, from the day of Passover. Now we'll get that in just a few minutes as we talk about Pentecost, but we understand that things have happened over these 50 days. Now if you just had the book of Acts, what would you say? Well, if we just had the book of Acts, we understand this much that we understand that Jesus Christ has given a mission to the church, that you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's verse 8 and, and following of, of the first chapter. We also understand that he has ascended to his father. And that happened, we understand, about 10 days earlier, about 40 days after his resurrection. But we also understand he told his disciples to go and wait in Jerusalem. And why did he tell them to wait? Because the book of Luke, Luke's gospel closes as where Acts picks up, that there's something going to happen to the disciples spiritually that Jesus says is a power from on high. This is the last few verses of the gospel of Luke. He says, go and wait until you are clothed with power on high. He says in, in Acts chapter 1, go and wait there and the promise of my father, this baptism of the Holy Spirit as it has been culturally and commonly known as today in today's time this something is going to be happening to you spiritually that you're going to have to wait on it wait on him we would say the Spirit of God to fall upon them something's going to happen to you while you're in Jerusalem so over the last 50 days what has been happening there's been a commission given by the Lord Jesus 
in his resurrected state. He is resurrected from the grave as he did over the course of Easter. We understand that. And then he has been with his disciples for 40 days and he gave them a commission. Then he ascended to his father. And then he told his disciples to go back from the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem. And I want you to wait there. Now, two Sundays ago, we looked at what happened to those 10 days. We understand that something else happened, that the 12 were completed, that Judas was a defector and he left the 12. The 12 was really never completed to begin with. They only had 11 and they replaced Judas with a man named Matthias. And now that's where we pick up the scene in chapter two. So all of that is in our heads. Not only do we have a a, a dead Jesus for the sins of the world, buried in a tomb and raised from the dead three days later, that's Easter. And then we have a resurrected Jesus that walked and talked and ate fish on the Sea of Galilee and all the rest. We have a Jesus that is commissioning his disciples to be witnesses in Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the world. We have a Jesus that ascended to his father that not only was the claim on the ground of of saying, yes, I am alive, but also I am Lord. There's the supremacy of Christ that he's ruling and reigning from the heavenly places that he has moved his ministry from an earthly ministry to a heavenly ministry. He has told his disciples to go back to Jerusalem to wait. And they're waiting. What are they doing while they're waiting? They're praying. They're they're worshiping. They're reading their Bible. They're going to church. (laughs) They're redeeming the time. And then as they're waiting, Luke says, when the day of Pentecost arrived. So in our minds, we have a calendar. When the day of Pentecost arrived. Now, the word Pentecost only occurs three times in your Bible. Once in Paul's correspondence to the Corinthians and once in Ephesians. And each time the word Pentecost is used, it's simply used to date a day. It would be like you and me saying, or you and I saying, well, when Thanksgiving arrived, or when Mother's Day arrived, or when the 4th of July arrived, it was a day on the calendar. And Luke says, when this arrived, this event happened, which begs the question, this is the setting, what is Pentecost? Now, in our mind, immediately we go, oh, well, Pentecost is this day that uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon the church. Or Pentecost, that sounds a lot like Pentecostalism, and we immediately go to those kind of definitions, but, but, but that's not Luke's intent at this point. Luke doesn't have what you have in your mind. He doesn't have that in his mind. He's just simply saying, when the day of Pentecost arrived. Pentecost, two lanes of thought for us this morning. Number one, I want you to begin thinking about the number 50. Pentecost is a Greek transliteration of the word for 50th. Penta, we understand, means five pentagon pentecost is the greek transliteration of the word for 50th so pentecost at the very minimum means 50 days from something 50 days namely from the weekend of passover passover was on a friday and then depending on whether you count from a jewish perspective or a roman perspective on sundown or sun up then you have the sabbath on a saturday And then Sunday was the very first of the week. So we understand in our minds we have Friday, Good Friday, then we have Saturday, and then Jesus rose on Sunday. Well, the Jews had several festivals throughout the the year, one of them being Passover, the other one being Pentecost. More on this, Leviticus 23, for instance, you can read about feast. Well, specifically the Feast of Pentecost, go with me just for a minute in your minds, Pentecost is also called the Feast of of weeks the feast of weeks and it was a festival at the end of what they said was a week of weeks now if you're like me i am immersed with homeschool well i'm not so immersed in homeschool i would say my wife is immersed in homeschool in multiplication tables (laughs) and multiplication tables are just part and parcel of just life in the thornton home if i was to ask you what is seven times seven What's the answer? 49, right? Well, a week of weeks is how many days? 49 days. So the Jews, starting on the Sabbath after Passover, they counted a week of weeks, 49 days. And the day after the week of weeks was what? The 50th day. And they had a celebration. 
celebration of grain, a celebration of harvest, a celebration of first fruits and all the rest. It was basically like what we think of as Thanksgiving Day. It was a day to celebrate what God had given them from a common grace standpoint, that he had given them life, fruit, nourishment. It was the Pentecost festival, the in-gathering, the time where they brought all the food to the table and they had a great celebration. So what Luke is saying is, listen, it's 50 days. It's been 50 days since the week of the, of the Passover. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, it's a celebration. That's what's happening. This is the time stamp of Luke chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived. Now that's going to be important, not only as we study what is happening in this feast, but specifically next week as we think about all the people that were there in Jerusalem for this great annual feast of Pentecost. So before Pentecost is anything, it's not about the Spirit, it's not about Acts 2, <laughs> it's a Jewish festival. A week of weeks, seven times seven, plus one, the 50th, the Pentecost day, when that had arrived, what does it say? They were all together in one place. Who is they? Likely, go up to verse 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. And then Luke gives us a parenthetical. He says, the company of persons was all about 120. So I'm taking, just on face value here, the they were all together in one place. I'm thinking the they is that 120. So we have 120 people together together. And those would be the first century Christians. Likely there are more Christians than just 120. But we would say these 120 are the gathered covenant community. This is, if you could, if you could title it like this, this is the church, the 120. These are the gathering of the Christians in Jerusalem. Led by the apostles, where are they? They're likely in the upper room. Why would I say that? We'll go a little back in your Bibles to verse 13. It says here, and when they entered, they went up to the upper room. When they entered from where? When they entered from the Mount of Olives. Remember, they were at the Mount of Olives that Jesus Christ ascended to his father. He said, go back to Jerusalem. He said, left the Mount of Olives, which isn't too far. You can, you can stand on the Mount of Olives and see Jerusalem. They went down the Kidron Valley and then up likely through the eastern wall, maybe through one of the gates there, and they entered into Jerusalem. Perhaps the upper room is outside the gates of Jerusalem. We, we don't really know for sure, but it, it was outside Jerusalem in a place near Jerusalem. They went to Jerusalem to wait, and they were in the upper room. So they were there, 120 people, on the day of Pentecost, and they were waiting. You know, a footnote here is, I just wonder if these 120 this is, just, this is a footnote of footnotes. I just wonder if these 120 were celebrating the day of Pentecost with the rest of the people in Jerusalem. Go in your Bible just for a, just a touch. Go to the right. Look at verse 5. It says, Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and so forth. We're going to look at that next week. I had a thought, I wonder if the 120 are celebrating like the rest of Jerusalem, or are they inside huddled together? I, got, I have a hunch, I just wonder if the 120 understand that something's going on with them because they've seen the resurrected Christ, they've seen the ascended Christ. They know that they're followers of Jesus and they know that the rest of Jerusalem is not. And they understand that there's some hostility. They understand that Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead. And to show yourself as a Christian may or may not be the most wise thing to do at the moment. We understand that when he was uh, appearing to his, to his disciples in perhaps the same upper room, when Thomas put his hand in his, in his hands and in his side, they, the, the, the door was locked for fear of the Jews. I just wonder that this Pentecost for these 120 is like no other Pentecost they've ever experienced. They don't know it yet, but they understand this much, that this wasn't like last year, guys. Remember last year, it was all smiles, it was all food and feasts, but this time we're just up here in this upper room and we're just waiting. We're not waiting on the festival, we're waiting on whatever God has for us. He's promised us his Holy Spirit, he's promised us 
this power from on high. I'm not sure if that's the same thing they would say. They've, he's promised us this promise from my father. This is verse 4 and verse 5 that you've heard from me that you are going to be baptized like John baptized with water. What's going on in this upper room? That gives you a context of this verse 1 of chapter 2. Well, we stop there and we move from the setting to the signs. Footnote again. We understand that the Lord Jesus, while he was still on earth before the cross, he made a lot of promises to his disciples. He told them that he was going to go to the cross and be delivered over to the hands of sinful men. Peter said, you know, far be it from me or far be it from you, Lord. And, and Jesus had to tell Peter to get behind me, Satan. He made promises about not only going to the cross, but coming back again. He made promises about going to heaven and, and building a, a mansion for us or building houses for us in John 14. But there was one specific promise that we need to be reminded of to insert in this place at this moment. And that was the promise that Jesus said, when I go to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Now let's do a little Trinitarian theology. We understand that, that God is three in one and one in three. That there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We understand that the Holy Spirit is God and He is coexistent and co-eternal with God the Son and God the Father. But we understand this much is that there was something about what Jesus said is that the Holy Spirit was going to take on a different role as He relates to humanity when Jesus goes to the Father. I want you to see this in your Bibles. Go with me to John chapter 16. This is probably just a few pages to the left in your Bible. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John's the last of the four Gospels. If you go to John 16, and this is the last week of Jesus' life, so if you're like me, you want a calendar in your mind, this is maybe Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday before Good Friday, which if you're totally counting days, this is really only about 55 days from Acts chapter 2, but look what Jesus says in verse, in verse 5. He says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Who is that? That's the Father. And none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled my heart. Why is he sorrowful? Because he's going to the cross. But also, remember, he's human, and he's going to leave his friends. We always have a tension between the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Greek there is parakletos, or the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And when he comes, notice he never says it. He's speaking here of the Holy Spirit as a he, the third person of the Trinity. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, here's the idea, is that Jesus is saying, listen, there's coming a time when I'm not only just going to the cross, but I'm going to be raised from the dead, and I will ascend to my Father. And we understood that happened 10 days earlier from Acts 2. He took his disciples to the Mount of Olives, and he raised, not just from the dead, but he raised through the clouds, and he went to his Father. And that was the, as we said before, the trigger pull for the fulfillment of what he is saying here, and he promising to his disciples in John 16, that if he goes to the Father, guess what? The Spirit of God is going to come down in a very special new way that He's never come before. Now, a little bit of a pneumatology, a little Spirit 101 here. We understand this, that the Spirit of God, as we said before, has always been alive and active. He's done a much, 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 much more throughout the, the, the history of redemption but, but than just simply Acts 2. We understand that He was here at the creation of the world. God, in the plural, let, let us make man in our own image. We understand that he has written the Bible. We understand that he has moved throughout the Old Testament. We understand that he fell upon the prophets. 
We understand that he regenerated and brought new life to dead souls. We understand that he did miraculous things and gave visions. Ezekiel 37, for instance, dead bones coming through the valley and the vision of Ezekiel. There's all kinds of of actions that have taken place from the Holy Spirit throughout the the Bible itself. But in, in Acts 2, what we're going to find is that just because the Holy Spirit was, you might say, with the disciples. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit was in the disciples until right now. The Holy Spirit is now going to switch gears and from Acts 2 forward, get this with me, the Holy Spirit of God is not just going to be with them. He's going to be in them. Now, here we are, 2023, 2000, almost 2,000 years removed from Acts 2, and we understand we have the rest of the Bible, we have the rest of the Christian life to understand we've been living this, that we understand a fundamental tenet of Christian theology is that when someone comes to faith in Christ, when someone becomes a Christian, when someone becomes a believer, the Holy Spirit not only regenerates, we call that being born again, it gives new life to your dead soul. This is John 3, this is Ephesians 2. But the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the life of the believer. Which means that if you're a Christian this morning, the Bible teaches, this is a wild idea, but this is fantastic, that God lives within you. That the same Spirit of God that lives in you lives in me. But up to Acts 2, that had not happened. That's why Jesus said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem because something is about to happen that is literally going to change the world. Something that has never happened before. We're about to enter into, you might want to call it like a a new age. I hesitate to use the word dispensation, but a new, a new age where the Spirit is now operating. He's operating in a different way than He's ever operated before. He's not just simply with the people of God. He's now in them. We understand 1 Corinthians 12, for instance, Paul says we've all been baptized by one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your body is the temple of the living God? First, for, uh, Ephesians 1, 13, I believe it is, that you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, that there is something very personal, there is something very indwelling about now as a Christian. You say, no, I'm a Christian, but I'm also indwelt by the Spirit of God. That's why we say that Christian, to biblical Christianity, please hear me, is not just simply a truth to be believed, but it is a life to be lived that when we talk about Jesus is able to change your life, we're not just talking about up here. We're not just talking about following rules. What we're talking about is that no, something on the inside has happened. That Christians believe and behave and live the way they do, not because they're just trying to pick them up by their bootstraps, not because they're just turning over new leaves every January 1st. No, it's because no... The Spirit of God lives with inside me. That's what's going on. That's a massive footnote in Acts chapter 2. We'll say more on a, a lot of things such as that as we work through the passage. But look at verse 2 with me. Now, the signs happen. At this time, the Spirit of God is going to be poured out. Peter is going to explain this from the book of Joel and, and, and subsequent verses. We'll be there in a few weeks. But the Spirit of God is now going to come down. He's going to visit. He's going to inhabit. He's going to dwell among his people. And in order to make this crystal clear, God is going to give his people two signs. Number one, the sign of sound. And number two, the sign of sight. Now, there's been much ink and even denominations formed over these verses, specifically chapter 2 verse 4. But I want, I want to try to clarify and cut to the chase for a few moments. Number one, what's about to happen, what we're about to read, is number one, not repeatable. So we shouldn't be looking for mighty wind, we shouldn't be looking for sounds, we shouldn't be looking for tongues of fire, we shouldn't be looking for this phenomenon. 
But number two, it was something that was given for their instruction. Let me ask you a question. If you're, all, if you're part of the 120 and you know that God has told you to go wait for, for the Spirit of God, wait, wait for the power of on high, wait for the baptism, whatever that means in your mind, you're thinking, he's told me to wait. How do I know when he's given me what he told me to wait for? How do I understand? How do I know that this has happened? Well, I would say that we understand the way that we know how he has given us this is because these signs take place. It was God's gift to his people that something miraculous has taken place. Something that is out of this world literally took place in this upper room. And they say, oh, now we get it. Something just shifted. Something just happened. So let's look at the signs. Verse number two. And suddenly there came from heaven. Suddenly out of the clear blue sky. It's helpful to understand this. They, they didn't ask for this. They didn't even pray for it. Whatever this is that's about to happen, all they're doing is just waiting. That's all they're doing. And there came from heaven, which is Luke's way of saying it came from out of this world. It's it's the regular word for heaven here. He's, He's not simply saying it was born in heaven, but he is saying it came from heaven. He's interpreting it, obviously, past uh, in, in, in years past, looking back on Acts 2, and he says this is something spiritual, something supernatural, something otherworldly. But the idea here is that it did not come from this earth. Something happened otherworldly. It's from heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now we have to clarify. Remember, we want to be textual people. We want to be uh, people to get our theology from the text. I want you to look at the text. It says, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, if you are an English major, I'm not going to raise your hand or ask you to raise your hand. If you like English, if you maybe teach English, you know what the part of speech is or the figure of speech is uh, of, of a simile. A simile is a comparison between two different objects, a comparison using what? Like or as. Luke uses a simile. Notice that he did not say that there was wind. He said there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, I say that not to insult your intelligence, but to simply give a little bit of the tip of the hand, tip of the hat to a lot of people throughout the years that have been saying, man, there was a hurricane force wind that took place in that upper room. I wonder if Peter's hat blew off. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says nothing about a true, real wind. All Luke is saying is that there was a sound. They heard something. And it was like a mighty rushing wind. You you see people interviewed after the hurricanes or after the tornadoes, and they say, "It it was like a locomotive was coming through my house. That's what's going on here. It it wasn't a locomotive. It wasn't even any wind. But what they heard sounded like a mighty rushing wind. In other words, God is getting their attention. He is getting their attention to to, to, to get them to to the place where something is happening that, that has not happened before. We could tease this out and understand that wind here would be... um would be a natural word to use. Luke is picking up on something as the Holy Spirit is, being, is communicating this, that the word pneuma for the Spirit has also been used throughout the New Testament to communicate wind and breath and air. The, the Hebrew Old Testament ruach is the same thing, wind, breath, air. So it goes to no surprise that a sound of the Spirit would sound like wind. We understand pneumatic devices or devices powered by air and wind and breath. But the idea here is that the first sign is a sound. They hear something. They don't feel anything. So as much as we want to say that the Spirit of God gives us warm fuzzies, that may or may not be true personally, you don't get that from the text. That that this wind was not something that 
blew the hair on my arm. It didn't blow the hair on my face. I didn't, the papers didn't blow over. There wasn't some kind of internal inside the room wind. There was just simply a sound. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now mark the word filled. The word filled here is plerao. It's not the same word as you see down here in verse 4, all filled. That's pimplemi. We'll talk about this in a few moments. This idea of being filled is that this sound took over the room. It had complete dominion and domain over the room. There wasn't any, there was nowhere you could escape the sound in this room. It's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5. Verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Be completely contained by the Holy Spirit. So what Luke is saying is that you could not escape this sound. This was something that you couldn't say, well, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. What, what, was that something? <laughs> no, everyone heard this. The whole room was filled, not with wind, but with a sound like a wind. And then it says in verse 3, and divided tongues, or your Bible might say in the Old English, cloven tongues. As of fire, note a, a second simile, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. What in the world is going on? Are, are you saying that there's a mighty rushing wind blowing through the room and Peter's like, get the fire extinguisher, There's the room's on fire. No, that's, that's not what is happening at all. There's no wind, and there's no fire. But it's like wind, and it's like fire. This is the way the apostles are communicating this to the historian Dr. Luke, saying, listen, there wasn't wind, but the best way I can tell you to describe what happened that morning was it was like wind. And then we looked, and then secondly, we, the second sign, we saw something with our eyes that was like fire. It wasn't fire. No one's hair caught on fire, but it was like fire. But it was like little tongues. And this is the weird thing. It says, and divided tongues as of fire. You see the word tongues in two different places in your text. The second time you see tongues, Luke is talking about a language. They spoke a tongue like we speak in the tongue of English. This first time is not a language being communicated. He's talking about a body part. This is James 3, for instance. The tongue is in the mouth. It's a small rudder, like on a ship. Well, he's saying a divided tongues of fire. It, it seems far-fetched, but, but the best way you can describe this is that there were, there were little pieces of fire over each everyone's head, that in Luke's mind, in the apostles' mind, looked like little tongues, divided tongues. This is the same word uh, that, that, that dispersed the, the food of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, same word that they would, you would use um, to talk about the, the garments of Jesus being dispersed as they cast lots as he went to the cross. He said that there was divided tongues. It wasn't a tongue like a like a snake's tongue. That's not the divided tongues he's talking about. He's talking about the tongues were divided. They were dispersed among the 120. So main things are plain things. Something was happening over the heads, we assume, of each of the 120 that looked like fire and looked like a tongue. Use your imagination for that. But what Luke is saying is, listen, we heard a sound and we saw something. And in that moment, we knew something supernatural was taking place. We can't explain this, but evidently when the Lord said to wait, this, I think, guys, I think this is what he was talking about because we've never experienced this before. A sound and a sight, divided tongues as of fire, which we stop here and we say, you know, the Lord, the Lord has used wind and fire, literal wind and literal fire, in days gone past. I mean, you just think about all the images of fire in the Old Testament. Let's think about a couple that he led his people with a pillar of fire in the night. That Elijah called down fire on Mount Carmel. So it comes as no surprise that these images of 
wind and fire are being used here on this day of Pentecost. But it says here they rested on each one of them. So in my mind, I'm thinking you got 120 guys, 120, 120 people, men and women, in this room. They're all waiting. They know it's the day of Pentecost. They're not thinking anything's going to happen because Luke says, and suddenly a sound from heaven from heaven came like a mighty rushing wind a sound filled the room they're looking around what in the world is that what's going on outside is something happening no wind i don't even see any trees blowing it's a sound and then they look up at each other and they say hey you got something on your head hey you got something on your head and something is happening above their heads that looks like fire and it looks like a tongue and it's on each one of them but then here's the significance quickly Verse 4. Now you're thinking, I'm glad we're not going through verse 13. Me neither. <laughs> verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. First time this word spirit is being used in this text. So if we're textual, we don't, we don't want to read too much. We don't want to read spirit up in verse 1. We just want to follow the text. And now we're seeing the interpretation of what's going on. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So that tells me whatever just happened probably has something to do with the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Significance. We've moved from the setting to the signs to the significance what in the world has just taken place what is happening and just as a footnote again i don't know how long the sound lasted i don't know how long the tongues of fire of as a fire lasted if i just had a hunch if i could take a wild guess an educated guess until they began to speak so when they begin to open their mouths and they recognize that you're not speaking the same language I'm speaking, that's probably when the sound ceased. That's probably when the sight ceased. That's just my best guess. Feel free to have your own. But, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I told you a different word here. The word filled, pimplemi, means that it was a, a, a sudden happening of filling that was instantaneous. Something happened to them same word that is used uh, when john the baptist when he was still in his mother's womb in luke chapter one he was filled with the holy spirit and he leapt he jumped he quivered kicked the <laughs> kicked the, the womb wall the idea here is that they didn't they didn't ask to be filled they were just filled it wasn't a command like in ephesians 5 be filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like, please fill my cup, and it was filled. No, the Luke is saying they were not filled, and then they were filled. It's the picking up on the idea of the suddenly, that suddenly we were not filled, and suddenly we were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the difference? Please lean in on this one. What is the difference between the 120 in verse 1 and the 120 in verse 4. I want you to ask yourself that question. Here you have the 120. Let's do a little, a little, a little textual theology here for a minute. Here you have the 120. I would say that you, you could faithfully, biblically call these 120 Christians in verse 1. They know who Jesus is. They've given their lives to, lives to Christ. They're following Jesus. From all theological points, we would say that the Spirit of God has regenerated them on the inside. They are born again Christians. If this 120 had passed away, if somebody had died in the upper room in verse 1, they're going to heaven. They're as, as Christians as they possibly can be at this moment. But we would say, but... But what they haven't experienced that you and I have experienced, yet they haven't experienced life with the Spirit of God living with them on the inside. They don't know what illumination of the text is. 
They don't know what the assurance of the spirit of salvation is. They don't know what spiritual comfort is. They don't know what spiritual conviction is. And, and the list goes on, on on the ministries. Romans 8 is a great help here on what the Spirit of God does on the inside to grow us and to live out and make us holy and, and produce the very process of sanctification in the life of the believer. They, they don't know what that is. They've never experienced the ministry of the Holy Spirit, if you will. But in verse 4, the Spirit now is now residing. In them. They're no, they're no more Christians in verse 4 than they were in verse 1. They're still Christians. But now they're indwelled Christians. But also something else has happened. It says here they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That same language filled throughout the New Testament, and Luke loves this word, does not communicate just simply the indwelling of the Spirit, what happens to you and I when we become Christians. That same word communicates a control, a domain, a usefulness. The same idea that we are to walk in the Spirit, we are to keep in step with the Spirit, it's not just that idea, but that we are to be used by the Holy Spirit. In fact, every time Luke uses this word pimplemi, guess what he attaches to it? Speech. It's this idea of the Spirit of God equipping and empowering. The old English word is unction. And he always uses this word with some idea of evangelism, proclamation, speaking, witnessing, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Specifically, one of the, one of the best examples of this is Acts 4. That They were in the, in the room praying, and they were praying uh, for, for uh, Christians in prison, and the, and, 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 and the Spirit filled them, and they began to speak with all boldness. It's a sudden filling. It's a sudden empowerment. That's what happened here in verse 4. And you have to ask yourself, okay, so what, what is all happening here? The best way I can, I, can, I can help you understand this is that as you and I, when we come become Christians, we are indwelled by the Spirit when we become Christians on that very one day. He's never going to leave us. He is now, we are now Christians who are indwelled. And as we walk with the Spirit, as we give our lives to Him, as we study our Bible, there are times we might say it's personal revival. We might say it's a time of equipment or empowering that the Holy Spirit fills us that he empowers, that he uses us in times and moments. It's the, it's the hug of the Spirit. This is all subsequent to this base foundation, the fact that the Spirit of God indwells us. What happened in verse 4? They got both at the same time. That's the best way I can describe that. They were indwelled and filled at the very same time. It's never going to happen like that again because you were indwelled in this, by the Spirit at the moment of your salvation and we pray as we walk with the Lord that He uses us, He empowers us, He equips us. It's a sudden, spontaneous, supernatural filling of the Spirit. But this time, same time. I'll give you the illustration I've used before. It comes from Tony Morita, I think. When you and I become Christians... If our life is a house, the water supply is hooked up at the curb, if the water is the Spirit. A utility company comes by, you buy the house, and you hook up the water at the curb, and now you have a water service. That's the indwelling of the Spirit. You have the water at the curb. It's never going to leave. It's at the curb. If you want water, He's there. <laughs> But there's an all different sense of using the water when you go on the inside of the house and turn on the faucet. And you say, oh, we do have water now. <laughs> That's the filling. It was as if they got the water hooked up at the curb and turned on the faucet at the very same time in verse 4. Could you imagine in your mind that if you... Um, 
if you knew when the utility company was coming, say they're going to come at noon, and you say, honey, let's go in the side of the house, and uh, it's about 10 till, let's go turn all all the faucets. You go upstairs and turn on the the, the shower, I'll go turn on the uh, bathrooms, and I'll turn on the kitchen, and I'll start the dishwasher. <laughs> and the utility company came by at the curb and turned on the water, and then suddenly water ran through the line in the front yard, it ran through the house, and then water came out of every faucet. Now in your mind, you're thinking two things happened at the same time, didn't it? Something happened at the curb, but then also something happened very, very personal. That's what happened here. And it says here, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We'll pick up where that leads in verse 5. You say, what what does all this mean? What's What's the so what? What's the significance of all of this? Well, let me just kind of remind you very quickly as we as we close I've said this before if we believe that the spirit of God indwells us and this is the time that he did this is this is when this happened that means that you and I are all indwelled by the very same holy spirit there is great unity <laughs> Same blood of Jesus paid for your sins as he did my sins. Same spirit of God dwells in you that he dwells in me. I read my Bible, I ask the same Holy Spirit, help me to, help me to understand the word that you, that you pen through human authors. I pray, I'm praying to the same God in the power of the same Holy Spirit. You say, hey, the spirit of God is pressing on my heart. I say, hey, let's talk about it. I think if the spirit of God is pressing on your heart, he's going to press the same thing on mine. Same spirit. But secondly, when you think about if you, if you are indwelled by the same spirit I am, guess what else is happening? The spirit wants the same thing in your life he does in my life. If you ask me, what's the number one job of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers? To make you holy. That's why the Bible calls him the Holy Spirit. Now, theologically, he does a lot more. He shines light on Jesus. He has obviously written the Word of God, all the rest. But for your life and for mine, it's to make you holy. So when we think about uh, discipleship, when we think about church ministry, we think about seeing people conform to the image of Christ, being made holy and mature in Jesus before we think about anything else. But then thirdly, when we think about what the Spirit of God is going to be doing in the church and in the life of the believer moving forward, is he's not only designed his entire MO in your life just to simply make you holy, but to empower you for a life on mission. That's why Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, you're going to be my witnesses. So Jesus is saying, Watch out for the holiness. <laughs> he will make you holy. But also, watch out for him to push you <laughs> towards living a life on mission for me. Which means as we as a church begin to think about what does God want to do with us as a church? Well, a great place to start is he wants to make us holy. And he wants us to be our his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the world. Holiness first, let's not get this out of order, holiness first, and then mission. There is a great sense of unity that comes when we recognize that the same spirit that dwells in you dwells in me, and the same spirit that dwells in you and you that dwells in me wants to make both of us holy and wants to move both of us on his mission to make Jesus famous and known not just locally, but very, very far from here as well. That's an amazing thought. So the burden for all of us, not only is do we want what he wants, but perhaps this morning you're, you're kind of listening to this and you're thinking, I'm looking at this from the outside, on outside looking in. I don't think I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. What, what do I do about that? It's not to attend a church service and raise your hands and say, I just want the Spirit to do whatever. No. Come to Jesus. 
that the blood of Jesus washes away your sin and mine. And we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I repent of my sin and I come to you. Will you save me? And will you, will you make good, I'll say it like that, on all of your promises for me? Not just my home in heaven, but your spirit on the inside. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have thought and talked about so much. God, I ask that you would um, continue to teach. Church, just take a, a minute or so and reflect. Ask the Lord to speak to you. Lord, the thought that is on my heart at this moment is that, um, Lord, you do things quietly and slowly, but you also do them suddenly. That's a tool on your tool belt, Lord. That there are times in life where things happen seemingly out of the clear blue sky. We're reminded of something very significant, obviously, Lord, in this specific text. But Lord, help us to remember that you are the God of the slow, but also of the sudden. Lord, would you make us an expectant people? People that believe that you can create from nothing? And bring into existence the thing that is not. God, where my mind goes is that we believe that you can raise the dead and bring the dead to life. The people this morning that would be spiritually dead, you can suddenly make them alive. So, Lord, I pray that you would awaken, that you would quicken, that you would open, that you would birth anew. Father, thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. May we have all eyes on the Lord Jesus the one who is quick to make promises and even quicker to keep them. In his good name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Let's stand and sing. Uh, this is a time simply of public response. If you want to stand, sing, pray, you can come to the front. I'll be at the cross if you'd like to speak during this time or after the service. We'd love to hear from you. Let's stand and sing to the Lord. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, shout of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all. Change the leper. 
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when Ushers can go ahead and start making their way forward um, and passing the plates while I give a few announcements. Um, first off, the New Bedford trip is right around the corner. It's about over a month away. Um, if you're interested in going and supporting Grace Harbor Church with their conference, I need like two more people to round out my team. So if you're interested, it's May 4th through the 8th. We'll leave early that Thursday morning. We'll come back um, Monday that evening. Um, if you can't go, but you would like to still help, maybe sponsoring someone else to go, if you have a schedule conflict or something like that, we could also do um, that. Uh, next, in conjunction with NC Baptist and the SBC, we plan to participate in a nationwide baptism on Sunday, April the 16th. So if this is something that you've been thinking about, taking that next step in baptism, this is a great um, day to do that as nationwide there will be, I'm sure, thousands of people doing the same thing. So if you're interested in taking that next step in your walk with the Lord, you can contact Pastor Jimmy um, to talk about that. Next, the Wilkie family approaches their departure date for the IMB missionary training. Um, we plan to honor them during by doing a reception on the evening of March 26th. So mark your calendars, come spend time with them, fellowship, tell them how much you love them, how much you're going to miss them, but how much we'll also be praying for them as a church family. Um, it's going to be following the 6 p.m. service on March the 26th. Um, quickly, three, um, come here, Pastor Neil, uh, talk about his recent trip to Israel. It will be this afternoon at 4.30. He'll run through some pictures. He'll talk about um, his experience, but he'll also talk about the possibility of a group from Coates Baptist um, going to Israel in the future. So today, 4.30, Fellowship Hall will be where that is taking place. I just want to put on your radar Easter services. They're also coming up pretty quickly. Um, you can check your bulletin for um, information on that. And then finally, parents, if you're interested in sending your upcoming third through sixth graders to Fort Caswell for Beach Reach, it is June 9th through the 11th. Um, try to sign up this month so I can call them and uh, give them a number. That is it. Susan Jenkins will now dismiss us with a missional prayer. Today we will specifically pray for six um, church planters here in North Carolina. They're, they are in Cary, Raleigh, Garner, Durham, Charlotte, and Concord. And um, three of these churches are just almost a stone's throw from Harnett County. Uh, the pastors are Gary Lee, Glenn Plastina, and he is um, pastoring a Filipino church, Grayson Furlow, Hector Ring. Ringuito, he is pastoring a Latino church, Ian Kitchen, and James Bassnett.
Please join me in prayer. Just Heavenly Father, normally when I talk to you, it's in the darkness of my own room, while driving in my car, while in my yard with flowers and my pets. So this is most unusual. I do thank you for always hearing our prayer. And we uh, pray specifically for these church planters who are in our midst. Uh, some of them need funds, some need volunteers, many and all want not just attendees, but disciples and um, members that will encourage their friends to join them in church and uh, learn the love of Christ. Some of them need buildings in which to worship and uh, they all need our prayers. And uh, Heavenly Father, you've sent us to many parts of the world. Several of us in this church have been almost everywhere in this world, but now you're sending more and more of your people from other countries that need love, they need protection, they need safety in our country. And they're among us, they're here even in this town. And we ask that you stir our hearts to pray for them and get to know these people that we may come, come in contact with. They're even in our schools, and some have attended this church, and we need to share the love with them. And we pray that uh, we'll see fit to do that and that your Holy Spirit will work within us so these, uh, this mission can be accomplished. And we love you so much, and thank you for your love and for Christ dying for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are sent. Thank you.